This is the eighth lecture in the course, The State of the United States Economy and Society. For a large percentage of working persons, income has stagnated or fallen in both nominal and real terms over the last 40 years. Wide is the gap between those at the top and bottom of the income ladder in the United States. The U.S. Census Bureau reports that in July of 2018, median U.S. household income was $62,450. What the blue lines tell us is that the purchasing power of this income in 2019 has not increased very much over what it was in 2000. In other words, $60,000 is required today to purchase what $40,000 would purchase in 2000. This second graph shows the impact of inflation more clearly. What the chart does not indicate is the number of persons contributing to household income to maintain a stable purchasing power. This chart shows how the gap between those at the very top and those in the bottom half of income earners has widened dramatically with each passing year since the late 1970s. The situation since 2016 has certainly become even more pronounced. Where one lives in the United States makes a significant difference. This map was produced by Zipia using data from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey in 2017. New York heads the list, followed by Connecticut, Louisiana, California, Florida, and Massachusetts. An article by Eric Levitz printed in the December 2018 issue of New York Magazine makes a point about just how bad the situation has become. In 1980, the average worker on the bottom half of America's income ladder earned about $16,000 a year in today's money. Over the ensuing three and a half decades, the average national income in the United States grew by 61%. That rising tide lifted all boats so high that by 2014, the average worker in the bottom 50% took home a whopping $16,000 a year. Meanwhile, the average denizen of the top 1% went from earning an inflation-adjusted $428,000 in 1980 to taking home $1,304,800 in 2014. This chart shows just how little of labor productivity increases has resulted in the hourly compensation of workers. One reason is declining union membership, raising a number of important questions on the reasons why fewer and fewer workers are unionized. As is often the case, the devil is in the details. And when the details are analyzed, there is controversy. An opinion article by Leonid Brzezinski, printed by Bloomberg in January of 2019, explains. Much of the current debate about inherited wealth in a number of Western countries is informed by the notion that most of today's top incomes are the product of passive returns on financial capital rather than labor. But in a new National Bureau of Economic Research working paper, four U.S. economists stipulate that much of that income actually comes from the returns on the aptitudes or human capital of the working rich. These returns are so great because large human capital is exceedingly rare. A research project undertaken by several economists at the University of Chicago and published in January of 2019 by the U.S. Treasury Department raised a number of important issues regarding the income level of those holding executive positions in businesses and other organizations. One of the co-authors of this paper, Eric Zwick, explained the findings published in this paper at a program at the University of Chicago as they pertain to firms owned and managed by one or a small number of key individuals. He stated, 
Most capitalists in the 21st century appear to resemble the working rich and not the coupon clipping rentiers of Marx's era. Owners are not only actively involved, but are in some sense instrumental to the income generating activity that is going on in these firms. A report released at the end of 2016 by the Institute for Policy Studies revealed that the 100 U.S. CEOs with the biggest company retirement funds have $4.7 billion in those accounts. This is roughly equivalent to the retirement savings of the bottom 116 million Americans, or 41% of U.S. households and 59% of all African American households. A report issued in mid-2018 by the Economic Policy Institute finds that a household needs an income of nearly $422,000 to be included in the top 1% of U.S. households. In Connecticut, you would need an income of $700,800 to be in the top 1%. In New Mexico, you need just $255,500. Income inequality is worsening and will certainly continue on this path as a consequence of the tax cuts now in effect. The Federal Reserve's data released in 2017 indicated that the top 1% of households received 23.8% of total income in 2016, double the percentage in 1992. At the same time, the bottom 90% of households received just 49.7% of income down from more than 60% in 1992. Median household income for whites continues to be significantly higher than for blacks or Hispanics. The underlying reasons for these ethnic and racial distinctions are complex, of course. Discrimination continues to be a serious obstacle for persons of color. Here is a slightly updated chart. Note that leveling off of median income for blacks and the decline indicated for Asians. This chart was published by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation in September of 2018. Educational level is often advanced as a major reason. While 47% of whites have completed at least a two-year college degree, the rate for African Americans is 33%, and for Hispanics, just 23%. The disparities increase for individuals who complete a bachelor's or higher degree, 32.8% for whites, 22.5% for African Americans, and 15.5% for Hispanics. And even where the educational attainment is the same for men and women, men still receive higher annual incomes. Race and ethnicity also play a role in determining the income of women when compared to other women. The increases in household income creating an expanding middle class in the United States peaked in the late 1970s. The concentration of income at the very top has continued ever since. A paper written by UC Berkeley economics professor Gabriel Zuckman, published in February of this year by the National Bureau of Economic Research, concludes that income inequality has again reached levels last seen in the years just before the Great Depression and the Great Recession of 2008. Professor Zuckman wrote, Wealth inequality has increased dramatically since the 1980s, with a top 1% wealth share around 40% in 2016 versus 25 to 30% in the 1980s. The wealth share owned by the bottom 90% has collapsed in similar proportions. As great is the difference in individual and household income between those at the top and those at the bottom, the difference is even more pronounced regarding the assets held by individuals and households. Forbes magazine reported that in 2018, 
the 400 richest people in the United States were wealthier than ever. The minimum net worth for inclusion in the 400 was $2.1 billion. The accompanying article in the Washington Post from the 8th of February 2019 notes that the share of total wealth held by the top 400 Americans has tripled since the early 1980s. The share of the bottom 60% has fallen from a high of 5.6% to 2% as of 2016 and is certainly less today. The data behind this chart reveals that the aggregate net worth of all U.S. households was over $122.7 trillion as of the 30th of June 2018. Increases in asset value over the last year have certainly increased the nominal household asset value shown here. What this chart reveals is the extent to which asset ownership is concentrated in the top 20% of U.S. households. By 2016, the bottom 90% of the population held just 23% of wealth. The top 1% had climbed to 40%. As one would expect, there is a strong correlation between household net worth and age. However, for many in the older age categories, the value of one's residential property amounts to a large portion of overall net worth. This pie chart, based on 2014 data, is the most current data published. A report issued in September of 2017 by the Institute for Policy Studies examined the extent to which wealth concentration is leading to deepening poverty among black households in the United States. Among the key findings, the nation's overall median wealth decreased nearly 20% from 1983 to 2013, from $78,000 to $64,000. White households in the middle income quintile own nearly eight times as much wealth, $86,100, as black middle income earners, $11,000, and 10 times that of, la of their Latino counterparts, $8,600. On average, only black and Latino households with an advanced degree have middle class wealth or higher, while white households on average need only a high school diploma to attain that same level of wealth. The rate of ownership for all households has fallen since the 2008 recession. An analysis of foreclosure data by researchers at the University of Alabama highlights the extent to which foreclosures disproportionately affect black households. An article written in December of 2018 by Edward Wolf, professor of economics at New York University, examined the data on what has occurred since the Great Recession of 2008 to the wealth held by African American and Hispanic households. His findings include The Great Recession from 2007 to 2010 hit African American households much harder than whites. Indeed, the mean wealth of black households suffered a 33% decline in real terms. The relative and absolute losses suffered by black households from 2007 to 2010 are to a large extent ascribable to the fact that blacks had a higher share of homes in their portfolio than did whites and a much higher debt net worth ratio. This graph provides an easy way to see the disparity in mean wealth by race. And to repeat what Professor Wolf has indicated, the main reason is that the net worth of blacks and Hispanics is dependent on the equity in a owner-occupied residential property. For Asian Americans, the level of net worth depends on a number of factors especially how many generations ago one's ethnic group came to the United States and level of education. Another factor is the percentage of an Asian American group who remain undocumented. 
Research by the Pew Research Center indicates that the Asian population in the United States has grown 72% since the year 2000, a central reason why this measure of income inequality has Asians at the top. Asians have a lower home ownership rate, 57% than the U.S. public overall, 63%. All Asian-headed households, except for those headed by a Vietnamese, 65%, or Japanese, 63%, individual, are less likely to own a home than American households overall. Households headed by some Asian groups have ownership rates well below the U.S. average. For example, only about a quarter of households headed by Nepalese, 24%, and a third of Burmese, 33%, owned their home in 2015. Nevertheless, home ownership is on the rise among Asian Americans. In 2000, 53% of Asian household heads were homeowners. By 2015, that share had risen to 57%. For most Americans, the most serious financial problems occur with retirement. Savings and pension data from 2013 indicate that nearly one in three workers had no retirement savings. Far worse, seven out of 10 African Americans and Hispanics had no savings. A survey taken in January 2019 by Go Banking Rates found that 42% of respondents have less than $10,000 saved. This survey reached 3,000 respondents in three age groups, millennials, Generation X and Baby Boomers. The Bureau of Labor Statistics adds concern, reporting that on average adults 65 and over spend almost $46,000 a year. Only when more current data is released by the U.S. Census Bureau will the situation be made clear. Moving on, we will next take a close look at how we own and manage nature.